nobody is ever prepared for death. Nobody. Nobody, he says with great authority. When I got that email from you that you were building the coffin, within about a week, we were all being notified that we shouldn't be going out to meet people, we shouldn't go for social gatherings because of COVID. When I started building the coffin, it was to have something to do with my hands. It was a wood project. People keep asking me why I built a coffin. Imagining death is like an inoculation, the introduction of a pathogen to stimulate the production of antibodies. But as you build a coffin, of course, you think about, well, who would go in there? So if I think about my own death, it's not that I want to die, but that's not as bad as, say, if I imagine your death or your mom's death or your brother's death. If I think about losing you, it's like I could just instantly disintegrate. And you almost died in 2013 when I was living in Japan. And the thought of losing you gave me this sense of panic because I couldn't be there. I don't think of myself as someone who goes around carrying a fear of death, but if I just sat with my eyes closed for 30 seconds and really thought about it, I could bring myself to tears instantly. Well, I think, more like most people, I did my best to avoid death and thinking about death. <laughs> but still, I always wanted something to do with my body. And so when I began to experience my own body, I had to think about death. I also had to think about birth, the beginning of the body and the ending of the body. You took mom out into the backyard, lay down, and asked her to measure the length of your body with your cowboy boots on. Was that a joke? Or were you actually being pragmatic? It was so strange to me that you would be out collecting these building materials for a coffin during COVID, during a time which would actually put you at risk. So I had to wonder if this was actually some kind of preparation for death. Sometimes it's very difficult to say, hey, old buddy, let's talk about death, because <laughs> everybody wants to flee if you do that. When my friend and I would go to the wood shops or we'd go to cemeteries, the aim was practical, but the consequence was actual conversation about living and dying. I think of you as someone who's never afraid to ask big questions because that's something that you've been doing with me since I was five years old. I decided to ask you all the questions that I couldn't possibly answer. That's why I call them the big questions. <laughs> They're so big that none of us can answer them. What happens when you die? You turn into soil. You turn into soil? I think so. Compost. Is that the end of it, when you die, and that's it? Well, no. You turn into something else, and you're alive again, but you're not what you were before ever again. Really? You turn into, like, a TV or something like that. And a TV isn't alive. <laughs> like a reindeer. Yeah. I guess you have to go to whatever you want to be. So if you want to be a reindeer, you have to go to a reindeer. Oh. How do you know that? I don't know it, and it's just what I think. I think you created kind of a blank slate for us when it came to thinking about all of these big concepts like death. And so because our understanding of it was rooted in play and these imaginative things, then over time we had a huge range of emotions and images that we could associate with death. We sent you to a workshop, a kid workshop for working with death. It was a Day of the Dead workshop run by a Hispanic couple. We pushed you kids out into stuff we're scared of. OK, you kids can go. Yeah, we're scared of death. You go, you go. 
I'm exaggerating a bit, but you all enjoyed it so much that I asked the couple, I said, could you make us a set? And they said, yeah, sure. And then they said, would you like us to model it on your family? And I said, oh, even better. No, we were happy to put you in that kind of a workshop. Because there were lots of things, you know, where you would color and draw. and We wanted something that would challenge you. As a creative kid, I always loved making things and working with my hands, which is probably something I got from you. And I love the way that you would always involve us in interesting projects and let us take the lead. I remember that coming home one day, the neighbor across the street said, your kids have been out in the street. They were picking up a squirrel body. Can you believe that? Your kids are out there picking up squirrel bodies? And I said, well, what are they doing with them? She said, I don't know. They're in your backyard. You better go find out. You and your brother, you were out there doing a funeral, burying a squirrel. And if I remember right, your brother was whirling this thing. And I said, what is that? He said, it's a spirit caller. And I was completely shocked because he never heard me use that word. <laughs> but I thought, a spirit caller. I thought that was the best possible <laughs> funeral that squirrel could ever have, probably better than most humans could have, is a funeral in the backyard. Sometimes words are not the right medium for me to be able to access how I feel about something. And so when you told me about your coffin building, and as we started to head deeper into COVID measures, and, I, and it was clear that I wouldn't be seeing you for several months, that disconnect felt really strange. And whereas before we would have gotten together, I probably would have been building the coffin with you. Something about that lack of physical contact made it much harder. When it came around to your birthday, I decided to build a mini coffin for you. Just to feel what that feels like, just to get my hands on a piece of wood, just to get sanding, to get, you know, handling that machinery, to get away from email and the internet and thinking about it through messages and to just make something. I am not a very yielding person. So I need to practice to know how to yield to death. You should prepare to improvise. So you've got to be able to move and shift. You have to yield to that situation. There would never be such thing as like, one day I'll think of death and it won't hurt anymore. But all of these things that we've done together, we've created a record. It's a record in memory and a record in these physical objects. And, you know, it means that we didn't wait until the 11th hour to say, hey, wait a minute, what did you ever think about this?